All right, here we go. It is time. Dallas Mavericks, Los Angeles Clippers. I just have one thing to say to you all. Uh oh, guess what day it is? Uh oh, guess what day it is? It's the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked On Mavericks Podcast. Hey, hey, Dallas Mavericks are in. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Angstead, media member and coordinator for the Locked On Podcast Network. Flying solo today. It's game day, like Dirk Uh-oh, said. Oh, guess what day it is. Guess what day it is. Game day. Dallas Mavericks, LA Clippers, game one happening today on Saturday. Hope you guys are all pumped for it. And today on the show, I'm without Isaac Harris, and I'm just going to talk about all kinds of random stuff that I've been reading, skimming through, hearing on podcasts, so much good Mavericks media stuff happening. So I just compiled it all together, and we're just going to talk about it today on the preview uh, before the game today. So this is all obviously before game one. Uh, But let's get into it. This episode is brought to you by Locker Room. Download the app and join us probably sometime today to get in on the action. Locker Room, changing the way we talk sports. All right. So, got to start first with Warriors Grizzlies because it was another incredibly good, (laughs) incredibly good play-in game. Maybe it's just the Warriors that play incredibly good play-in games, but all the West games, average margin of victory, four points. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Average margin of victory for the Eastern Conference games, like 24 points. So wild, the dichotomy, the difference between the East and the West. And the playing games, were, were the two of them were great. The two that the Warriors were in were absolutely incredible, fun games to watch. This one with John Morant, Steph Curry. Like, John, like Steph Curry, man, like that guy, 39 points in this game, and they lose. Like, he just can't get any help. Like, they just have no... Nobody. If they had Clay Thompson, it, this whole season would be so different for them. But these games would also be so different. It's so fascinating to watch in basketball how there's only five guys on the floor. We talk about all the other ones, but there's only five guys. And so one single person, one single player changes it up so much for a team. Just having Clay Thompson out there would have just changed so much for this team in watching this. But Hats off to the Memphis Grizzlies. They are, they are a team that came to play. They were ready for it. They defended really well. Their ball movement, I thought, was awesome in this game. John Morant, like, he hit five threes in this game. So it's hard to say, well, he's not a great shooter. In the regular season, he hasn't been a great shooter. And in his career, he hasn't been a great shooter. But he's not the best shooter. Uh, but he just, man, he just wins games, man. There's something about a guy like that that can just go... And not not even really like go get a bucket. He can every once in a while. He did hit some clutch buckets. He hit the, you know, drive, spin, pull up like little floater a couple of times when they needed a bucket. So he can. He has like a go-to move like that. But he's not your, you know, James Harden. He's not your Luka Doncic. He's not your one of, one of the guys like that. But he can do what is needed. And he can play defense. He got a bunch of steals in this game. The Warriors, so many turnovers. I think Curry had seven. Draymond had six in this game. Wild to watch the Warriors kind of fall apart in that way. But this Warriors team also, man, they look so gassed in this game. They just look so beat down. They've been playing for their lives the last couple of months, and that Lakers game probably took so much out of them. So, yeah, Memphis Grizzlies move on. They're going to face the Utah Jazz. That series that series is probably the NBA TV series, right? Like, I don't know if anybody's getting super into that series, but I think the Memphis Grizzlies are going to take a game. They're going to surprise take a game because they're sort of the mirror image of this Utah team in the fact that they have, like, one star, so, like, Mitchell and, and John Morant. They have, like, one big that's really, really good at stuff, and that's, like, I guess Jonas and Gobert, but it should be Jaron Jackson Jr., who has not been that good. And then they're just really deep. Like, they... they, they the comparison breaks down with the second best player, but they're a really deep team, both of them. And the Grizzlies team is just so young and the, the jazz team is just way more experienced. And so that's, it's, it's what's going to come down to, but it's interesting to see that team get in 
Uh, there's not as many ref things that would <laughs> would favor the Warriors as as people thought there was going to be. There's was, there was Scott Foster in the game. He refed the game, and still the uh, NBA's desired uh, outcome for this one didn't happen. So interesting on that, but great game. Awesome playing game. Uh, let's get into some Maverick stuff. So yesterday on the show, if you watched, the uh, Clippers guys are on from Locked on Clippers, and I told them a stat, and I said the Mavericks are 20-0 and or 22-0 and when they're leading after the first quarter. Uh, a listener responded back to me and said, hey, they're actually 26-0 and when the Mavericks are leading after the first quarter. And I was like, oh, dang, I way undershot it. And I undershot it because I didn't want to say like 30-0 and and be wrong and it be like 25 or something. So I kind of undersold it a little bit, but I knew they were still undefeated. I should have just said undefeated probably. But I didn't know what number exactly it had gotten to. So a listener told me 26, and then Mavs PR responds to me and says, it's actually 27. So the Mavericks are 27-0 and when leading after the first quarter. Definitely something to watch for. How many times did the Lockdown Clippers host say that the Clippers start slow? It's something really to watch. This game is going to be played 130 local time for the Clippers. And so I think that matters. I think it matters a lot for them. And so it'll be this first game is going to be so fascinating to watch. A lot of stuff to to get into from practice. Actually, we had um, we had Carlisle talking about Maxi. Maxi is still progressing. He's still he's probably like a game time decision. Really, like I, from the way that I've hear, heard Carlisle talking, he usually would be really upbeat and really encouraged by what he saw if he thought somebody was ready to play. So for Maxi, that's a big one, man. If Maxi was one hundred percent healthy, I'd feel better about this series, but. Maxie's not, and so that's why the Clippers are going to win two games. Uh, no, that if Maxie is if Maxi is playing, then it's just a different. It's the calculus is just different for this team. The other thing is news from Carlisle. JJ Redick is out for the series. Uh, he didn't necessarily declare that. Carlisle didn't declare it, but he did say I would be surprised if JJ Redick plays in this series, which I thought was really interesting from him to come out and just say that. He was asked about JJ Redick's status and. Doesn't seem like he's going to play. So that's really interesting, I thought. Uh, and the other one, there's a lot of other random stuff from practice. So there's a couple of clips, a couple of things that I wanted to play and talk about. So we'll get into some of that stuff, get into uh, more of this. I have no idea how long this this is going to go. This video, this podcast, I really have no idea how long it's going to go. Uh, we'll go until I run out of stuff, I guess. So coming up, we'll get into some more stuff. There's a fascinating, fascinating stat. That's not a stat that you normally think about. It's not advanced analytics, but maybe it's like, like, like next to analytics. It's like, like really close to that. That was brought up in media availability about Josh Richardson and Paul George. We'll get into that coming up. But before we do, I got to tell you about Theragun. Theragun is a uh, percu- percussive gun that you um, <laughs> the handheld perc- percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combo of depth, speed, and power. And it's as quiet as an electric toothbrush. It is an absolutely incredible device. If you have stress in your daily life, I know we all do, It's in, whether it's in your body, if you're an elite athlete or even just a casual athlete or whether you're somebody like me that is nowhere close to an athlete at this point, just try and make it through the day tension-free. Theragun can help you. Theragun's Gen 4... Uh, gun doesn't just feel good. It gets to the source of the pain by releasing tension using Theragun's signature percussive therapy, which goes 60% deeper than vibration alone. The OLED screen and design make you feel like you're holding something from the future. Just go to their site and check it out. And the Theragun app learns from your behaviors and suggests guided routines. So you get these devices and you're like, how do I use them? They give you the routines for it. So go check out Theragun. It's trusted by 250 professional sports teams like Real Madrid, athletes like... Oh, this, they actually have this guy listed. Paul George. Athletes like Paul George. DeAndre Hopkins, uh, Maria Sharapova, hundreds of thousands of customers, and including the Lockdown Podcast Network. Try Theragun for 30 days starting at $199. Go to theragun.com slash lockdown right now. And get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's theragun.com slash lockdown. Theragun.com slash lockdown. All right. Josh Richardson. Is he going to start? Is he not? He spoke to the media today. He had a really interesting comment about coming off the bench and how he has been coming off the bench recently and wasn't hasn't been a starter. And so we'll get to that quote in a minute. But this was the stat. This was the advanced stat or whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it came from Law Murray, who is a Clippers Clippers beat writer for the Athletic, um, and he's been in Mavs media recently in their zooms, and he's been asking some questions. And he asked this question of Josh Richardson today about how he defends Paul George. And 
the Mavericks traded for Josh Richardson to come in and defend a guy like Paul George. And so it's notable. But the stat that stuck out was that Paul George has been fined twice in the last couple of years. Twice in the last couple of years. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me just read. This is from, from Law Murray. This is a quote from one of his more recent articles in The Athletic. Paul George is the only Clipper to be fined at all since 2019. The only Clippers player. And he's the only been fined twice. Both times came after road games against Josh Richardson. <laughs> Wild. Who would have thought? Uh, in February two, 2020 at Philadelphia, George was held to 11 points on 3 of 15 shooting in a loss to the Clippers. Paul George missed 6 of 7 shots and drew 0 shooting fouls while covered by Josh Richardson. So Josh Richardson put the clamps on Paul George. And then afterwards, Paul George uh, was docked, was fined $35,000 for referring to the refereeing as home court cooking. So that was when Josh Richardson was with the Sixers. After being held to 30 points on 9 of 31 shooting from the field in the first two games against the Mavericks, George was able to score 28 points on 10 of 20 shooting from the field and 5 of 8 from 3 in the March 17 loss at Dallas. But Richardson spent most of his time on George and held him to 1 of 4 shooting and no shooting fouls while forcing two turnovers. Afterwards, George tried to dismiss the explanations given to him by officials for his lack of free throws as, quote, bunch of lies. And that cost... Paul George, another 35,000. So Josh Richardson has almost single-handedly been responsible for uh, Paul George paying $70,000 to the NBA. So what does this mean? Like, what does this mean? This is an interesting stat, obviously. It's interesting kind of coincidence that this happened. Maybe it's Josh Richardson. Maybe it's just a coincidence that, you know, Josh Richardson knows something that the refs don't catch. Who knows who the referee crews were were in that game. But is Josh Richardson the, the key to guarding Paul George. Does he have something? Does he know something? And and Law Murray asked Josh Richardson about this and he didn't really have an answer. He's like, "Man, that's a real interesting stat. I wish I had an answer for you as to why it that was the case." But he doesn't. He didn't have one. But is Josh Richardson the Mavericks answer for it? This takes me back 2 years. This is an example I think we brought up more times because it was just so wild and it stuck out to me so much. But the beginning of not this past season, but the season before before COVID and all that, the beginning of the season, the starter on opening day for the Mavericks against the Wizards was Courtney Lee, who nobody thought was going to be a starter, let alone have like a rotation spot. Uh, no one thought that he was going to be a, a player that played a lot of minutes for the Mavericks. But he came out and he started game one. And the reason that Carlisle told us that he came out and started Josh Richardson was because Courtney Lee was the best guy to defend Bradley Beal. <laughs> and he was the best guy. They went back and watched all the film since it was game one. They had a whole bunch of time on their hands, I guess, and watched all the film of every single Maverick player defending Bradley Beal. NBA teams have access to stuff like that. They went back, they watched it all, and Courtney Lee did the best. And so they decided to start Courtney Lee against Bradley Beal. This is before Westbrook was on the team, so it was the only guy you really had to care about on the Wizards. And so will the Mavericks do something like that? With Josh Richardson, he's he started a bunch of games this season, and he has there's a reason for him to start is because he just can't can come in to defend Paul George. Does he mirror Paul George in any way? I just find that so fascinating. I found that really really interesting that Josh Richardson has one been successful against Paul George, and then two has cost Paul George those two fines for the calls that Paul George didn't get against him. Uh, and against the Mavericks and then the Sixers before that. Really, really interesting. Thought that was fascinating. So will will Josh Richardson start today? By the time you're listening to this, you may know that. Uh, another thing that I found really interesting today, and this is coming from uh, Iztok Franco, who is a writer for Mavs Moneyball. And he, uh, he I think he's, he's been a listener to this podcast. Hopefully you're listening now. You wrote a great preview piece about these two teams, basically breaking it down film-wise, you know, what these teams are good at, breaking it down really, really well. Uh, he said the worst part about Dallas's defense is fouling. They're ranked 24th in opponent free throw attempt this season. So the Mavericks are in the bottom of allowing teams to shoot free throws. So the Mavericks al allow a lot of free throws, basically. They foul, and the other team goes to the free throw line a lot. But the Clippers only ranked 27th in free throw attempt rate, which is basically the amount of free throws you take per the amount of field goals you take. It's that kind of ratio. 
And so the Clippers don't take a lot of free throws. You think you think of them as a jump shooting team. How many of those guys can you think of that drive and like go in the like go in the paint like Luca does or James Harden or LeBron and try and finish around the rim? Kawhi doesn't really do that. Paul George doesn't really do that. Uh, Lou Williams kind of did, but he's not on the team anymore. Rondo, no. Reggie Jackson, maybe kind of not really. Like there's just not a lot of guys there. All of a sudden, like Marcus Morris, no, he's shooting jumpers. There's not a lot of guys. Nick Batum's out shooting threes. Not a lot of guys that are going to get to the rack and are going to draw fouls or even draw fouls in their jump shots, really. And so that's an interesting wrinkle, I thought, going along with this Paul George thing. The Mavericks, uh, they do foul a lot, but the Clippers don't draw a lot of fouls to go to to go to the free throw line, at least. So that's a really interesting stat that I found or that, that, that Isdok found that I thought was really interesting. Another thing I found in his article, and we're just kind of hopping around here at this point, the Clippers, he said their biggest weakness, pick and roll defense last in the NBA in pick and roll ball handler defense, 23rd in NBA pick and roll roll man defense. So that was the biggest weakness that he found going through both of these teams, which is true. And we talked about it. We've talked about how much Dwight Powell and Willie Colley Stein are going to affect this series. I think it's going to be hard to find them time to play, especially if Kristaps Porzingis is healthy and plays a lot because playing two bigs against the Clippers is really tough. It's really tough to get away with that defensively. But on offense, if you can get away with it, you can do some damage with with Dwight Powell and Willie Colley Stein in the pick and roll. It's something I've been been talking about all week. It's something that that's what's going to matter. I think that is a thing that is going to matter. So, there you go. That is a couple of stats there. A couple of things about the Clippers and the Mavs. Um All right. Christoph Porzingis was on Ben and Skin, who are on the Mighty Eagle. I don't know what you just call it, the Mighty Eagle. Is it just the Eagle? I think it's just the Eagle. It's radio station, but you guys all know Ben and Skin. Skin on the Mavs broadcast, obviously. Ben, not, but still famous Dallas person. Uh, they had Christoph Porzingis on for a good, a solid like 10 minutes, and I thought it was really interesting. The most interesting thing that came out of this interview, they asked him a question, and the way Christoph's answered this really fascinated me. Christoph Porzingis gets a haircut every five days. Every five days. Now, his joke was that he gets a haircut every day, and he he didn't. Then he took it down to like, no, 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 it's a reasonable every five days. Okay, every five days. That means you have to count out every five days because it can't be, all right, I get my haircut every Sunday. That's every seven days. He gets it every five days. So like, okay, I get my haircut on Sunday, and then I'm going to get it again on Friday, and then I'm going to get it again on what, like, Wednesday, <laughs> like the next week or Tuesday, whatever it is. He has to count it out every five days. Does he have just like a counter? Does he just look in the mirror and just instinctively say, okay, every five days I'm getting my haircut? I found that fascinating. <laughs> so interesting. He gets a haircut every five days. I guess you got to look good, man. I guess he he got he has to look good. And he, he made a joke at the end. He said, well, got to make sure that it stays in. They're made sure. I'm glad that I still have my hair. I'm not going to lose it. <laughs> Every five days it gets a haircut. What a random number. The real most interesting thing is that Ben and Skin asked him, what's your most underrated skill? It's an interesting question to ask to a player. It makes the player all of a sudden say, all right, now they have to weigh a couple things. The player has to weigh, all right, what are my skills? What do people think my skills are? And how do people rate my skills? <laughs> right? Like, so what's his perceived uh, idea of what all of us, you know, the common people, <laughs> what we rank his skills as. And then he has to decide which one of those doesn't match what I think my skills are, which is a fascinating question for Porzingis himself. As we know, we've been talking about a lot. He thinks a lot of himself and, you know, Mavs fans have been disappointed in how he's played. He's wanted a bigger role in the offense. He's wanted a bigger role in more touches and all that. Not saying anything, any any about any of that is wrong necessarily. Not saying any of that, but so anyway, he didn't answer the question, but Skin answered the question for him because he said he had an answer, and he said it was his passing and so it was his court vision, which is true. Por- Porzingis has surprised me a little bit ever since he's come to the Mavericks. He's been a pretty good passer, and he's made the right play for the most part when when a pass is available and open to him. When guys are moving, he's he's willing to move the ball around, but. Porzingis' response to to Skin's answer was really interesting to me. He said, when the ball is going through me a lot, and I know it's coming back to me, I want everyone to touch the ball. Everyone wants to touch the ball a lot. 
it's another it's another thing about ball movement that he wants to to enforce in this team, which I think is positive, right? You want ball movement. The Grizzlies had great ball movement in this game against the Warriors. And they end up winning this game. A lot of teams have in the in the past have had great ball movement and won championships. Now, have they had a player like Luka Doncic? Probably not. The Spurs come to mind. The you know Warriors come to mind. The you know the the Dynasty Warriors. But Kristaps Porzingis again reiterating that he wants the ball to move around. He wants the ball to be passed a lot and all that. Just found it really interesting. Coming up, let's get into some more stuff about. Uh, Josh Richardson, he a- answered a question about the bench. I still have a clip from Tim Hardaway Jr. on uh, J.J. Reddick's podcast that I want to sh- I want to play and want to get into. So a couple more things we'll get into and play, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about some of this. Um, we'll talk about some of these things and these, these clips coming up. But before we do, let's talk about BetOnline.ag. It is the place to put down some money on sports. If you're listening to this right now, before the Mavericks play, you can still put down some money. They're still going to have those lines available for you. So go betonline.ag, use the promo code Locked On, and get a 50% welcome bonus to the first deposit. Let's check in on Game 1, Dallas Mavericks versus the LA Clippers. They have currently, the Mavericks are a 5.5-point underdog against the Clippers in LA for Game 1. Pretty interesting, five and a half points. The biggest spread is Nets versus Celtics, it seems. Yeah, Nets Celtics is an eight point spread. Bucks are a four and a half point favorite over the Heat. You have the Nuggets now a one point favorite. And that's interesting because the Blazers are the favorite in that series so far, but the Nuggets favorite for game one because it's home, they're home. Sixers, a seven and a half point favorite over the Wizards. Suns, a three point favorite over the Lakers now. Interesting, because the Lakers are favored in that. So a three-point spread instead of... So there's two series where the underdog is... Or the uh, the lower seed is favored. That's Lakers, Suns, and that's Blazers, Nuggets. But both of the home teams are favored. And the, the Lakers won by three points. Really interesting. Anyway, go to Bet Online, Use the promo code LOCKDOWN. Get a 50% welcome bonus. Your first deposit. Uh, Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. All right, let's hear from Josh Richardson. He was asked about coming off the bench and playing off the bench. And I found his answer really interesting, so let's hear him. You know, just, just trying to be professional about it. Um, and, you know, I, was, I was kind of upset at first, but, uh, you know, bigger picture, it's the playoffs, and, and we don't have time for anybody to be worried about personal, you know, issues or, or anything like that. So, uh, you know, from the bench, you know, coming in with JB, uh, Willie, you know, Trey, guys like that, uh, we bring a different look to the game. So we're going to play at a different pace. We're going to play fast. And uh, just being able to, to see the flow of the game before we get into it is probably going to be good. Just interesting about him coming off the bench and him, you know, understanding that, yeah, his role has changed. And with some stuff we've been talking about recently about him kind of waking up to the idea that he's not the player that he thought he was or that we thought he was. And so he's, Realizing that, yeah, there are some benefits coming off the bench. He mentioned JB. He mentioned, you know, Willie. He mentioned a couple other players there. And he can watch how the flow of the game. He's he's kind of, you know, positively reframing this whole situation for himself and saying that, yeah, we get to see how the game is flowed and how the game is flowing before we go in, which is great. I'm glad he's accepting it. And it's not there's now two players now that maybe it's just to the media, but Porzingis about playing the four and then Josh Richardson about coming off the bench have there some roles have been changed a little bit recently for the Mavericks benefit. And those players have come around to the, the idea of these changes. It's positive. It's positive that it's happened and it's positive because I think it happened because Rick Carlisle got to them, right? Rick Carlisle got to them and said, it's for the betterment of the team. This is what we're doing. Explained it, had some time, had some practices to show KP the plays, show Josh Richardson what they're going to do. And They've come around to it. I thought that was positive. It seems like this team is kind of coming together. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of, you know, infighting. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of disagreement or anything like that. It seems like this team is cohesive going into the playoffs, which is huge. You have to be together. Have to be together if you're going to pull off an upset like this against the Clippers. Really, really interesting, I thought. Uh, All right, let's get into this clip from... Let's get into this clip from... uh, 
Man, I found this so interesting. From uh, JJ Reddick's podcast, Old Man in the Three. I found this clip really, really interesting from him. Uh, He was asked about Tim Hardaway Jr. going into a slump. And when Tim Hardaway Jr. went into a slump recently, uh, how did he get out of this slump? Now, this is always really interesting because how does a player get out of a slump? And what do they do? Like... When I, when I first got on the team, like, you were consistent. You know, the minutes kind of fluctuated, but the shooting was consistent. And then you had, like, a five- or six-game stretch where you had a couple down games in there. You had a couple average games. Yeah. But it, you could tell it wasn't flowing. Right. And 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 I don't want to say you were pressing because I, I don't know that you press. I don't think you necessarily press. But it just it, it felt like the flow was off a little bit. And so throughout my career, at least when I've played big minutes and, and you know, been asked to take double digit shots on a team, my mindset has always been eight for 12. And eight for 12 is basically like if I get if I take 12 good shots tonight, I'm going to make eight. Right. I can't I can't look at I can't think about every single shot and putting weight on every single shot. If I do that, yeah, I'm going to struggle. I'm going to struggle. Uh, you have to be in that flow and yeah, you got in that flow. I wanted, I wanted to read you this. I, I know you. So I found that interesting because we're going to play a little bit more of this. It's a little bit of a longer clip, but I found it interesting because before that, Tim Hardaway Jr. goes to JJ, said he went to JJ and said, how do I get out of this? Remember when Tim Hardaway Jr. was going through this slump? And it was really interesting that JJ and Tim Hardaway didn't want to call it a slump. Maybe that's just a mental thing, but they didn't want to say the word slump or call it what, what Tim Hardaway Jr. was going through a slump. Maybe it's just a shooter's confidence thing. But when Tim Hardaway Jr. was going through that, when all of us were saying, you know, I think I, I tweeted out, like, these are Tim Hardaway Jr. stats. He's he's due for a game to come out and play like crazy. And then a couple games later, he had 40 points. Right? Like, he just all of a sudden came out of this. J.J.'s mentality was 8 for 12, if you caught that. Tim Hardaway Jr. mentioned it before, and then J.J. Redick mentioned it. 8 for 12. If I'm a shooter and I'm going to get I'm, – I'm going to get – you know, a bunch of shots in a game, or at least 12 shots. I'm going to take 12 good shots, and hopefully I make eight. And that mentality is you can't focus on every single shot that you take because it'll just drive you nuts because as soon as you miss one, all of a sudden it's overblown in your mind. You have to think about it sort of like a batting average, right? You have to just hit a certain number of them, and you can't focus on so many. You focus on it as a whole. Focus on your shooting as a whole. Really interesting mindset from a shooter and from an NBA player that they would think about it that way and try and contextualize it in the way that it's, you know, take, you take a bunch of shots and every shot you take is a good shot, hopefully. And you hit, if you hit eight of them, you're great, right? Like you're, you're doing great and just keep that mentality. Uh, Be interesting to see if you were like, what if you're like seven of 11 and you take that next shot and you miss it all of a sudden it's mess with your brain in that way. But also I found it interesting that Tim Hardaway Jr. went to J.J. Redick because this is something we brought up when J.J. Redick was traded. He's going to be a vet that can help these guys who's been in big games, been to the finals. He's kind of replacing J.J. Barea. He's replacing those guys in that. He's replacing him in that sense because they don't have this team. Whether he plays or not, these guys can go to J.J. Redick, who is, by all accounts, a creature of habit, who is a guy that has an incredible work ethic, incredible uh, like um, pregame routine and all that kind of stuff. He can help them become pros if they need help in that area. And so I found it interesting that Tim Hardaway Jr. specifically mentioned himself going to J.J. Redding. Now, maybe he just said it because he's on his podcast, but I found that really fascinating that he went and asked him, and then that was J.J.'s answer. Uh, and then here's J.J. talking more about you know, getting out of a slump and about uh, that mindset golf too i wanted to read you this rory quote that i found it was actually during your hot streak and i thought of you and the quote was um when you're playing bad you feel so far away and when you're playing good you always think to yourself how did i feel like i was so far away right and it's amazing how quickly that can turn yeah and it turned for you in the detroit game and i think that also i mean i think that also went to account of just being around family as well. You know, when you have family, my family, my mom, I mean, my parents and my sisters, they live in uh, outside of Detroit now. My dad was the assistant coach for the Pistons years back. But um, just being able to go see them and being able to 
be at home around your family, your parents, and being able to sit down with your dad to, and watch basketball the whole entire night, that, that right there, I think, really just helped, you know, clear a lot in the air, clear my mind, and help me go out there and do what I do best. It's amazing. It's amazing, Tommy, what being around your family can do for you, for your performance. <laughs> We've never, we've never talked about that on this show. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Don't worry, everybody. Anyway, I wanted to end on that joke because I thought it was so good. JJ Reddick making the, the, the joke about playing with family. Uh, but I thought that quote was interesting. When you're on a slump or not a hot streak, and then all of a sudden you get on one, you never realize how close you, like how far away you felt from being back on. Or how close you were to you know to being off or whatever, but man, really interesting mindset from from JJ there. And then Tim Hardaway talking about family. He mentioned a lot about how his family matters and being there and being able to watch games with his dad and be have his dad in the, the arena. That's something we've talked about a lot. So anyway, that's from the old man in the three JJ Reddick's podcast with Tommy Alter. Great podcast, awesome interviews with players around the league. Go listen to it. Go subscribe to their YouTube channel. Incredible stuff they've had. You know, Tim Hardaway Jr., they've had a bunch of Mavs players on there, so go check it out. Uh, I think that's all I got. Mavs Clippers today. Great stuff. Oh, Dirk was on Bill Simmons' podcast. He didn't say a ton of interesting things. He shared some memories from 2011, most of the stuff we've all heard before. He talked about how the player movement has sort of changed the NBA and how it's different from when he was a, a player, found that interesting. He had an incredible story about Luka in practice and how when he first was practicing against Luca, he went up to him when Luca was about to shoot some free throws after Dirk fouled him really hard just to try and test him, just to try and test and see what's this kid got. And he fouled him, and then he went to him at the free throw line and started talking trash to him. Luca just looked at him and smiled and then went and hit the free throws, <laughs> which is exactly what Luca would do. Uh, and then he talked about Luca complaining to the refs, and he said, I couldn't say anything to him because I complained to the refs all the time. <laughs> found that fascinating. And then he still has not had a discussion with the Mavericks on his role with the team. So now we're a couple years out, still have not had a discussion about it. I'm skeptical. Is <laughs> Whenever Dirk is going to get bored, I think he'll come back and start talking to the Mavs. But still has not happened. He's still enjoying retirement, which is great for him. Last thing he mentioned was his left ankle. Remember, he had surgery on his left ankle at the end of the 2018 season. He was out for a bunch of games, and it's the one he jumps off of when he takes his you know turnaround one-legged fade. And he said the surgery actually made it worse, and so he's really struggling on it. And that was that kind of that tugged at your heartstrings, and you're like, man, this guy still played through it. Two more years after that, still played through it a little bit. Tried to, and you know, he can barely like like he still has trouble with it today. To, you know, now even not playing basketball, so wild stuff. But there you go. Go listen to Dirk on Bill Simmons podcast. Mavs Clippers game one. Hope you guys enjoy it. Hope hopefully it's a win, and you'll catch us afterwards. We'll be breaking it down, guys. Thanks so much for listening to Locked On Mavs. Peace out. Boom.